Welcome to tonight's seminar. Uh, my name is Patrick Tapia. I'm the Vice President of Counseling for HS2 Academy. So tonight's seminar, uh, I think it might seem a little bit strange now that it's still only January and we're still in winter for some parts of the country, but I want to talk to you about maximizing your summer for college success. And the reason why we're starting off this early is that most of the activities that are most uh, like competitive, the most selective ones, actually will have deadlines just right around the corner, right? So I think it's very timely that we already start our planning even this early, like five or six months in advance, just so you can set yourself up in a position to be much more successful for college applications, right? So while it might seem strange talking about like summer this early, right? It makes a lot of sense if you're planning right, if you're looking far ahead to see like what you can do to make yourself more competitive. All right. So first of all, um, I, I want to ask, like, how is that summer best used? For most schools, you'll probably have a good like nine or 10 weeks uh, in order to position yourself to be much more competitive, right? To get a head start or to get a jump on your competition, if you will. OK, so let me ask you. Uh, so how should you spend your summer, especially if we have any students in the uh, audience today? Should you? Uh, Hole up in your room and play video games all summer, Call of Duty, Fortnite, or whatever uh, is your interest, right? So is that the way you should do it? Okay, you probably already know the answer, right? Or should you start binge watching some of the shows that you've been wanting to catch up on, right? Uh, some people really love to sort of just jump into those rabbit holes and watch like Netflix or, you know, whatever um, shows that you've been meaning to watch, okay? Or should you just be on social media with your friends, glued to your phone, be on TikTok every single hour of the week? Or none of the above? Well, if your goal is to get into one of the best universities in the country, I'm going to say none of the above, right? None of those are bad individually, but if you do it in moderation and you still have a larger goal for the summer, then I think it's okay, right? You don't necessarily have to say like, oh no, I can't play video games or I can't talk to my friends. I'm not advocating that. Uh, but I do want you to have higher expectations for yourselves in terms of what you can do during the summer, okay? All right, part of the reason for this is that things are only getting harder every single year, okay? Uh, so first of all, um, we want to take a look. So, so these are the most recent college rankings based on U.S. News and World Report. So as you can see, a lot of these names are familiar, right? So many of these schools in, uh, here are going to be part of the Ivy League, right? In fact, I think all but... Okay, hold on. I think but all but Cornell. Uh, actually, no, uh, Columbia is also not here this year. Okay, so all the schools on this list, uh, six out of the eight Ivies are represented here as well. Okay, so as you can well imagine, these are the big name brand schools. These are the schools that everybody thinks about when you're thinking of like the most competitive, the most rigorous academic environments in the country. Okay, but another category of colleges that I think you should also explore uh, are the liberal arts colleges. Right. So these are smaller colleges, uh, typically. Uh, and the main criteria that, that that distinguishes a liberal arts college from a national university is that a liberal arts college simply doesn't have grad school. OK, um, you don't want to mistakenly assume that a liberal arts college is only a place where you can only take um, you can only take liberal arts majors, right? Which is what some people think of when you think of like humanities or social sciences, right? So in fact, uh, many of these schools are actually incredibly strong for fields like, you know, like bio, if you wanna go pre-med, uh, places like Amherst and Pomona are some of the strongest places to study pre-med. Uh, a school like Swarthmore, for instance, also has engineering and computer science. In fact, there are some liberal arts colleges that are devoted to preparing students just for engineering. Uh, case in point, uh, there are schools like Harvey Mudd uh, out in California or Olin in Massachusetts that are dedicated to preparing students just for computer science and engineering. Okay, So you don't want to mistakenly assume that a liberal arts college wouldn't be a good fit for you just because you're not interested in whatever major you think they're, they're going to cover there. Um, so in fact, liberal arts colleges do have some advantages over the larger research universities in the sense that the professors are only there just to educate undergrads. So you, you can form much closer relationships with, with your professors. If they do offer research opportunities, it's catered just to undergrads, right? Now on the flip side, if what you wanna pursue career-wise is much more research-oriented, then of course it makes more sense for you to look more closely into these big national universities, okay? 
So the national universities in that left column are also called research universities for a reason, okay? Uh, these big universities will also have maybe a broader array of majors. That's another advantage that you can think of too. So if what you wanna study doesn't neatly fit in a box of like a traditional major like biology, or you know, electrical engineering, or say for example, political science, then you're gonna have a better chance of studying things that are maybe like an interdisciplinary overlap of two fields if you went to a larger university, because there'd be more courses, there'd be more departments and more faculty to teach a wider array of classes, okay? Now, um, if you live in California, um, one other really good sort of advantage, advantage that you have out there is that six out of the top like 15 or so, you know, top public universities are actually in California, right? So as you can see here, um, like schools like UC Berkeley, UCLA, even schools like UC San Diego and UC Davis are all part of the top 40 as far as, you know, US news rankings are. And this is not just for public universities, these are for all universities, okay? So public universities are often excellent choices as well, especially for fields where they excel in the most. So I would say schools like Berkeley uh, are going to be outstanding for fields like engineering or business, right? I mean, they're still pretty good overall, but uh, for those fields, they're probably just as competitive in many regards to the Ivies, right? So it's definitely one thing that you want to consider. If you happen to live in a state, for instance, with excellent public universities, that should be part of your strategy to also apply to those schools. And if you want to aim for maybe even more selective schools, that makes sense for you to also try for that, okay? Um, also, uh, did you know that there are actually over 5,000 universities and colleges across the United States? So yes, um, it might seem like these colleges are really hard, but it's only because people want to apply to the same colleges, right? So we have our set sort of like, these are the name brands, if you will, for universities. So everybody applies to these same schools, okay? But if you're willing to look at other options, you might actually find some good value schools in terms of schools that are still pretty strong for your major, even if they're not necessarily the most recognizable, if you value like the overall strength of your undergraduate education a little bit more than say the ranking, right? So of course you want the best of both worlds. You want a school that's very well known, but you also want to make sure that your backups are also incredibly strong for your said major, okay? So what does this, all this have to do with summer basically? Well, I mean, as these colleges get more and more competitive, it's important for you to realize that like you need to up your game, right? You need to find ways to distinguish yourself from your peers. And unfortunately, during the school year, there's only so much you can do because most students will have the same classes. You're going to have access to the same clubs and activities. So summer is usually that optimal time when you can do things to make yourself stand out even more, right? To do even more than like what your classmates are doing. So as you can see, uh, this is still from last year's, of course, like we don't know the regular decision results just yet, but if you take a look at last year's acceptance results for the IVs, things are only getting harder, right? So of course, uh, things uh, dropped down precipitously like a couple of years ago, and that's in large part because of the pandemic. As colleges uh, gradually waived their requirement to have the SAT or ACT as part of their admissions requirements, more students decided to apply to them, which is why you see these massive drops in most of these colleges in terms of the acceptance rate, because all of a sudden, like a lot more people feel like they have a shot at Harvard because they didn't have to submit an SAT, okay? So things are only going to continue to get harder, okay? But hopefully it's kind of stabilizing a bit, so it's not just going to be as big a drop as like two or three years ago, okay? These, in fact, are the most recent early action, early decision acceptance rates. And so in a way, there's kind of good news because they're not quite as low as those rates that we just saw for the regular decision rates. OK, but even then, many of these schools, it's actually decreasing. I mean, there's some outliers. There's some where it actually increased a little bit. But I think for the most part, like the acceptance rates for these early schools are even getting harder and harder. In fact, we just found out today that USC, uh, which is a school that just added early action this past year, uh, only accepted 5.9% of their early action applicants, right? Which is kind of ridiculous, but they also had a huge number of people apply, right? I think they received almost 40 or actually over 40,000 applicants for their early action, right? So of course, you know, it's going to be very, you know, fiercely competitive, right? So, and I guess that's kind of what USC wanted, right? They wanted to really get more applicants in the pool so that they can look more competitive, right? So if that was their intent all along, mission accomplished. 
Okay, so what does all this have to do with the summer? Well, we want to position yourself to be much stronger. So if your goal, if your aspiration in high school is to get into a top university, like a top 20 or top 25 university, then you really need to understand what it is they're looking for, right? So these schools, as you saw earlier, have like, you know, they'll only accept one in 20, one in 25. So it's critical to really set yourself apart, to distinguish yourself as much as you can, to show that you're unique, that you're showing advanced skill sets for whatever it is that you're choosing as your major, to show more passion for learning, basically, right? So these are all things that you can accomplish if you plan your summer as well. Okay, so if you were to look at the criteria that colleges typically take a look at, so these are taken from an institution called NACAC which is the governing body of all the admissions officers and all the high school guidance counselors in the country, right? And so when they do these yearly surveys, they, they had um, that their members rate which factors are the most important. And not surprisingly, of course, your grades are the most important, right? Like how hard are the classes that you're taking? What's your actual GPA in those classes? So the strength of your curriculum does matter as well, okay? So for institutions where you have to submit testing, then of course, uh, SAT or ACT is pretty important, but like there are also schools like the UCs, like Caltech, that are effectively what are called test blind schools right now, where they don't even look at the SAT or ACT and they tell you not to even submit it. Okay. So in those schools, you could just sort of like rule out or just kind of like just draw a line through that factor, right? So testing is not going to be used against you if you're not able to or choose not to submit it. Okay. But other than that, everything else follows suit. So obviously your, your essay is gonna be important. Your recommendation letters are also pretty important. And then here's an interesting thing. The extracurricular activities might seem kind of low, but you have to consider the fact that, hey, if you're applying to some top schools, most if not all of the candidates for those schools are gonna have pretty competitive GPAs. They're gonna submit good test scores. And of course they're gonna get great recommendation letters. So even though relatively speaking, these things look like they're lower in the rankings, things like your talents and extracurriculars become even more important the, the closer people get, right? So the more you have like top notch candidates, this is really the one factor where you can set yourself apart because let's face it, at the end of the day, how do you outdo someone with a 4.0 unweighted GPA? Or so like, you know, the best you can do is match them. Hopefully you have some ex impressive extracurriculars and, and hopefully you get some great recommendations as well, okay? All right, so what can you do in order to prioritize your summer? So I normally suggest that you focus on four main sort of criteria to determine how to best use your summer, okay? The first is your academic record, okay? because it doesn't make much sense logically for you to apply to all these like internships or competitive summer programs if you're already struggling to maintain a good GPA with your school right now, right? So it would make more sense for you to go ahead and either use the summer to prepare for the upcoming school year or perhaps take some extra classes to sort of bolster your GPA. And we'll talk a little bit about that in terms of what you can do. Uh, if you are planning to apply to some schools that do require the SAT, and I'll talk about a couple of those later on, or you're just looking at the test to maybe like bolster or compensate for a GPA that's not higher, then of course, summer is one of the best times for you to prepare for the SAT or the ACT, okay? Um, one thing about this upcoming summer is that like for many of you, uh, one test format that's gonna be newly introduced in the spring of next year, not this current spring, uh, is the digital SAT. Right. So which means if you're planning to take the SAT, it actually makes a lot of sense for you to use the summer to prepare for it because there are a lot of unknowns. Right. So many people don't know what to expect with that new test. Yes, there are a handful of diagnostic tests that College Board just released like a couple months back. But, you know, people will develop tricks and strategies in terms of how to do better on the SAT. So if that is something that you want to use to sort of like set yourself apart even more, then you should really consider preparing for SAT this summer. Okay. So some of you may also need to build evidence for your major. Okay. And what we mean by this is that if you're applying to more competitive majors like business, computer science, or engineering, uh, it's not going to be enough that you get good grades in, let's say, math and science classes. You want to show that you're participating in activities that are building your skill sets and showing that you're actually very passionate about those fields. And so obviously, like the summer is a great time for you to be able to kind of like build up a core list of activities, right? So be it a summer program or an internship or even just taking some extra coursework to show that you're interested in these fields is going to be really important for the summer. 
And then lastly, the summer can be useful to you know make yourself look more well-rounded, to pursue activities that like maybe like make you look less stereotypical, right? So let's say, for example, you're looking to do computer science or engineering, but all your activities are so stereotypical, kind of like STEM, right? So summer can actually be a good time to sort of vary up or change up what you do in your profile, right? So that could be another good use of the summer as well. So let's take a look at each of these in more detail now, okay? So priority number one is strengthening your academic record. Right. So if your grades aren't all that strong, you know, it makes a lot of sense for you to use the summer in order to boost up your profile. OK, so many people weren't aware of this, but you can actually make up certain bad grades by taking summer school. Right. And it can even be through like an online high school. I mean, this is essential, absolutely necessary. If let's say, for example, you got a D or an F in a class. Right. But even if you got like a C, you can still take more courses outside in order to sort of balance out that bad grade. OK, so there are a couple of institutions that we've normally recommended in the past. Uh, there are places like the National University Virtual High School. There's a place called Apex Learning where you can take courses to go ahead and boost up your profile. OK, so regardless of whether or not your school will accept these credits, you could still send a transcript directly from one of these institutions. But I think it's also best that you first ask your school counselor whether or not these these courses will carry over or transfer over to your transcript. OK, you can also boost up your overall profile by taking college level courses, right? This can be as simple as like taking local community college classes. But if you wanted to take things that are more rigorous, you could take things from actual universities, like four year universities. Like every single year, HS2 had partners with UC Riverside to offer exclusive courses just for our students. Now, if your family can afford it, or you just want to actually go visit these colleges, most of the top colleges will actually have something called like pre-college programs where you can take an undergraduate level course at like a Stanford or a Harvard or a Columbia, right? Now, of course, they're going to be charging their normal tuition rates, right? So it's kind of common for you to spend maybe something like five or six thousand dollars per course if you're taking it at those institutions because that's like their normal per unit rate okay so you know like it depends on what your goals are but that's certainly a factor to consider as well if you're thinking of taking extra coursework during the summers okay one other thing you can do if your gpa isn't necessarily the best is you can always use the summer to prepare for your upcoming classes this would be especially necessary if you're thinking of taking much more difficult classes like honors or AP classes the following year, right? So I would especially say like if you're a current sophomore and you're planning to take something like AP biology or AP US history during the summer, it's almost essential, right? It's almost mandatory that you spend some of your summer going ahead and previewing for the material you're going to cover during the school year, okay? So what if your grades are already great? You're already an A student. You know, what can you do in the summer to help out with that? Well, the thing I mentioned earlier, you could still take additional courses, right? You can take college level courses because every college level class you take is essentially calculated the same as adding extra AP level semesters into your GPA, okay? So in theory, if you're already a straight A student, but you didn't maybe have as many weighted classes for ninth grade or 10th grade, if you were to take, let's say a college level class, that would count the same weight as like an AP level class. It would be counted as a 5.0 GPA if your high school operates on a 4.0 GPA, okay? Uh, you should also try to preview for your most difficult classes, right? So over the years, like I've uh, I've met some students who, who've ch challenged themselves by taking something like four, five, or even sometimes six AP classes, okay, the following school year. So and that's going to be really difficult to do if you're not spending part of your summer to prepare for that, right? So we normally uh, tell students, go ahead and order your school textbook for those classes even before the summer. So that way you can craft a plan for you to go ahead and study that material so that that way when the school year starts, you're ahead of everybody else, right? You've already looked into the material, you're maybe like, you know, a good month or two into the content before everybody else. And that'll make it much easier for you to be able to get great grades, right? So that's typically the secret that many students have that allows them to take so many AP or IB classes is that they really spend the time well ahead of time to prepare for those classes, okay? 
All right, so how can HS2 help you, right? So every single year, HS2 offers preview courses for the whole range of AP classes. Uh, for some more challenging honors classes, we do as well. Like, like every single year, we help with like honors pre-calculus, for instance, right? Because we know in many of the high schools that we serve, these are classes that like can sometimes be very challenging for students. So we wanna make sure that students are prepared for these things as well, okay? Uh, we also give students access to college level courses. Like I said earlier, we have a partnership with UC Riverside to, uh, to offer college level classes just for HS2 students. The great thing about that is that if you want to take a college class, but you're a little intimidated by taking a college class with college undergrads, I think it's nicer to be in the same pace with students that you know are all at your level. Okay, and then lastly, our counselors use the summer to help make strategic plans with students, right? Recommend the ideal course schedule, uh, recommend what kinds of things that they can do during the summer to prepare. Oftentimes, too, our counselors are very familiar with a lot of the local high schools. So if we have certain resources that we got from previous students in terms of things that we know that those students will cover during the school year, we can tell students, oh, okay, during the fall, there are these projects that your teacher will typically give. So you can actually already start to prepare for it during the summer. Okay. Okay, 